Good morning, everybody. Very nice to see you here. So hands up all those who understood what the previous speaker said. <laughs> <laughs> I was never any good at maths. And <laughs> Very good, fantastic. Yes. Isn't that great? There's somebody <laughs> No, for whom it's completely transparent. It's absolutely amazing. We'll come to that in a second. I just wanted to show you this because um, yesterday we had a wonderful adventure, and thanks to uh, somebody who was in Cambridge many years ago, he arranged for us to go and visit his fish farm, uh, which is the most southerly point of Singapore, and you have to get to it by a little boat, by a splash, past all these amazing, huge containers. Anyway, so this here is the best female fish. They make these fish and they then they get them up to about four or five, between four and five kilos in the sea, and they sell, they then fillet them and sell the fillets in supermarkets or online. And they were terrific. And you wouldn't believe, I mean, in on one sense, Farming fish is terribly low tech. I mean, great big concrete tanks or just nets in the sea. But in another respect, it's unbelievably high tech. I mean, they've they got one tank with little creatures. They don't have a picture of it. You know, there, there was sort of a million dollars worth of fish in this tank. But there were also a few floating dead fish. And there are the, the, the low tech part, the lowest of the low tech yet high tech part was in inoculating these fish. They get a vaccine which contains seven components because there are seven major viruses or bacteria which infect these fish. And if they don't uh, inject them with the vaccine, then they take a terrible loss. And I said, you know, you ever lose a whole tankful? And the guy, you know, ruefully shook his head and said, yes, I'm afraid you, you know, it has happened. And then there are other amazingly sort of trivial yet difficult problems, like they live in these nets out in the, in the harbor, great big things, that are 12 meters deep and I think 25 meters across or something like that. But the nets just get fouled by seaweeds and mollusks and things very, very quickly. We were shown one which was already sort of encrusted with sea organisms which was only a couple of weeks old, you know. So, and this is, so there are all kinds of crazy practical problems. And then, you know, in, in, in breeding these fish, and these are about, these are, I mean, it's an amazing thing to learn. Do you know these fish change sex after about, they start out as males, and after about two years, they turn into females. Extraordinary. I didn't know that. Anyway, they're very good to eat. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, oh gosh, it was just wonderful. And the guys sort of knew so much and they had to deal with all this hydraulics and, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Anyway, um, so I want to dedicate this, uh, this, is, this is serious. I, you know, Sidney Brennan was very important here in, in Singapore. And I, he was sort of part of my life for about 50 years. I, he taught me as a student. Um, I interacted with him. He was very kind and generous to me. He could be very cutting and cruel um, to, especially to women, actually. I think he had a, I don't know why, but I, one, at least two or three times I saw him be really awful to women. But um, he really was a genius, and we'll sort of come back to him again. And it's, um, sorry, to have, sorry to have lost him. This is a photograph I ran into him in Heathrow, in the, you know, in the departure. Business departure now, and he's still he was 87 years old. And he was still lecturing. I think two years ago he gave a, a lecture to his, his audience. It was fantastic. And he could speak extempore, no slides, completely lucidly for as long as you wanted. Always fascinating, really, really interesting. Amazing man. We shall not see his life again. So um, I know that this is a very heterogeneous audience, and I wanted to show you this slide, which was, comes from a funny book called Soft Interfaces. It's a book really about the physics of friction, and very interesting by a guy called Pierre Gilles Lejeune, a very famous uh, 
uh, French who invented the liquid crystal display, among other things. But he was a great communicator. And I think it's really interesting. I mean, I really had this thing about the, you know, why most of us can't understand maths, because we're just not clever. You know. um, but Julian uh, says, good science is clearly a form of art and the same invention and the same doubts, but there are major differences. And one is the difficulty of communication. Indian playing his fruits in the flute in the streets of Bogota invents a new tune and within 10 seconds a passerby may be struck by it perhaps for their whole life. But in our trade, he's talking about the soft matter physicists. A beautiful discovery can be transmitted only to people who have been through a long specialized education. We must do our best to keep in contact with our fellow citizens, but we often fail. And I sort of came across this. I had to give a talk in similar circumstances to get into a similarly mixed audience. And the biologists all said, oh, that was a great talk, Tim. And the physicists all said, you know, I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> you know, I, I apologize that I will do my best to communicate, but uh, I can't guarantee it. And I really want to tell you the story of my life, that's because that's all I know. So the first problem for any young scientist is finding a problem. And uh, I went to my supervisor, and he said I should go to the library to find a problem. So I went to the library, I found a great problem, and it didn't work because I made a silly mistake and didn't understand what kind of rat I should be using. It was just as well because I hated working on rats. So after six months, I had absolutely nothing. I mean, I sort of learned where the tunes were kept and things like that, but otherwise nothing. So luckily, then I went to a, my first conference. And I can't recommend going to conferences too highly, actually. They've always been real seen, you know, rather influential in my life. And I heard two talks there which made an impression. The first was by Borsu here on the, on the left. Uh, who talked about uh, the things he'd worked on, which were sea urchin eggs and uh, hemoglobin synthesis by immature red blood cells. And uh, he introduced me to the thing. And then the, the thing that really set me going, gave me a problem, was Vern Ingram's talk, who talked about the control of uh, globin synthesis by iron. Now, this is not actually globin, hemoglobin, this is myoglobin, the thing that makes your muscles red and stores oxygen. Here's the heme, which is chemically completely different from the protein that encloses it. And um, what Borsu had found was that if you deprive the cells of iron so they could no longer make heme, which of course has iron in the center which carries the oxygen, um, they stopped making the protein. There was a control mechanism. We added the iron back, they started up again. So there was a reversible control of um, protein synthesis. And what Ingram said, oh yeah, and uh, what Ingram said was, so here's a protein being synthesized. They're synthesized <laughs> linearly, but when they're, as they're made, they, they, they fold up. I love this picture, actually, it's so beautiful. Uh, it's a very old one from David Phillips, who discovered the structure of lysozyme and how it, how it worked. Actually, it was Louise Johnson who found out how it worked. Uh, her supervisor was David Phillips. All right, so the proteins are made like that, starting at one end. And uh, here they are being, so the messenger RNA defining the sequence of amino acids. And what Ingram said happened, and why the heme controlled it, was that they got up to the point where the thing would fold to make, to allow the heme to come in, the heme pocket it's called officially. And if there weren't any, um, heme around, then the ribosomes would wait for the heme. They queued up and wait for it. And then if it came, then on they'd go. So, gosh, what an interesting theory. So I went back to the lab and explained this fascinating story to my fellows, who were a bit cleverer than I was, and said, well, what's the evidence? And I said, tell them what the evidence was. They said, well, that's backwards. It's wrong. And we realized this great scientist who made a sort of rather, you know, trivial misinterpretation of his own data. So we decided, and when I say we, 
the two key people were Lou Reichardt and Tony Hunter. We decided to see for ourselves what it was. And we also realized that there was a better way of doing the experiment. We, had a, we, were, we were cleverer than this guy. Uh, it, it, in retrospect, I can't imagine how we thought we were going to sort of beat an MIT professor. But there you go. And we did. And I may say that Ingram later, who edited the paper where we proved conclusively that he was wrong, and he was incredibly generous about it, and he was really pleased that somebody had taken his theory seriously and proven him wrong, and I think that's the mark of a great scientist. So then the second meeting I went to, by this time I was sort of looking for cues in ribosomes and on messenger RNA. I, I went to a meeting in Greece, and I won't tell you the whole story, but I ran into this guy here in London who turned out to be interested in the same thing, how he can control protein synthesis. And over on the right here is the sort of the canonical uh, experiment, which we kept on repeating for years and years. And pointlessly, actually. I mean, it was fantastically reproducible. You could make a cell-free system from these reticular sites, which uh, you can see here. This is stained to show RNA, so these young cells are still making hemoglobin. They've still got ribosomes and messenger RNA in them. Um, and uh, if, you, if, if you simply add uh, water to these cells, they burst open, and then you spin off the junk take the supernatant, and freeze it in liquid nitrogen, and, and it still behaves perfectly. I mean, you have to add max and things that are, have been diluted, of course. Um, and, and when you did that, you, you, it was wonderful. You, you, when you have heme, protein synthesis proceeds beautifully in, in, in vitro. If you don't add heme, it curls over and more or less dies. And if you add back heme, then it, it recovers. So you know, the question is, what the hell was going on there? Well, I didn't discover that in uh, my postdoc in, in, in New York. And I went back to Cambridge, uh, taking, by the way, a five-fold cut in salary, which was quite something. In fact, the guy from the, um, what do they call it, the Department of Total Obscurity came to see me. And uh, I say, why wasn't I paying my social security contributions? When I told him how much I was earning, he said, well, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I went like from earning $11,500, I forget what the exchange rate was, uh, to eight, earning 800 pounds a year. That wasn't very much. Anyway, but I worked with Richard, and Richard was uh, followed Jim Watson's advice, which is to always work with people who are clever Jolly good advice there. Uh, and uh, we, we worked on this thing. And um, by this time, it had been discovered that the reason why lack of heme blocked protein synthesis was because an inhibitor formed. And somehow this inhibitor was reversible. And the inhibitor blocked ribosomes from starting on the messenger RNA somehow. And so we started to investigate this. And this is a very sciencey slide. I don't expect mathematicians to understand this at all. Uh, but Richard and Tony had discovered that uh, protein synthesis was initiated with a methionine residue carried by a special initiated tRNA. The biochemists will know this is a very ancient and trivial. Um, and what we discovered was that um, when I say we, of course, it was actually a graduate student, not me. Uh, uh, was that when you left out the heme, there was this funny peak of methionine radioactivity over the small ribosomal subunit. And people have seen that before, but they thought it was just, you know, this methionine tRNA sticky. But what we saw was that this big peak of radioactivity disappeared when you left out the heme, and importantly, it disappeared before protein synthesis stopped. So this, whatever it was, was a precursor to, uh, it was the first step in protein synthesis. It was this step that was inhibited. So it's very interesting that in a way, because we discovered by studying the control, something about the mechanism. Um, you know, you might say you can't possibly understand the control until you fully understand the mechanism. It turns out that's not true. You can learn a lot about the mechanism by studying the control. At least that was the case in 
in this case. Nobody had ex ex suspected the existence of this precursor. And, 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 and we found it, and it was right. And it was the first example I had when we wrote this up. People were very skeptical. The referees gave us a hard time because they said, these guys don't know the first thing about protein synthesis. We proved that this did not have messenger RNA. So what happens is the initiated tRNA binds to the small subunit, and the small subunit primes the initiated tRNA, then goes looking for the start of the message. And it's all backwards because normally the binding of tRNA is specified by the message. In this case, it was the binding of the message that was specified. By. There's nothing Ill illogical about it, it's just that it was contrary to the dogma, and therefore people were skeptical. But it was, it was right anyway, and we knew we were right. You know, we'd done all the controls and stuff. And then the lab burned down. <laughs> And it was a wonderful thing. <laughs> because at the time, uh, we were extremely baffled. We really were not making progress. We got a lot of phenomenology. And the whole lot went up in flames. Okay. Actually, it's a very, very funny thing. Tony Hunter is a, is a very assiduous note taker. And he had these stacks of notes in a filing cabinet. And, uh, when we went in after the morning after the fire, you know, it was still smoldering. And Tony opened this filing cabinet and the whole thing burst into flames again. <laughs> Shut it and put some water on it. And he's still got these notes which are all charred around the edges, which he likes to, to show. So uh, very luckily for us, uh, we had to move. We moved to a hematology lab, which was right opposite the famous laboratory of molecular biology. Uh, and Max Perutz, who was then the, the chairman of the board of the, the lab, was very kind and generous to us and, and said that we could use his stores and use his canteen, which was fantastic. And then it turned out there was some wonderful insurance policy. We got all new equipment, so all the rusty old water bars were replaced with brand new ones. And within six weeks, we were back in business with, with a sort of clean slate. And I think that was the thing. But not only that, we, uh, this lunch wasn't to be sneezed at, because it was actually packed full with Nobel laureates. And here are some of them. Uh, you know, and, and these are great heroes. Francis Crick was really, I never had a conversation with Francis with, with which he didn't say something that illuminated my own work. I mean, he, people say he didn't suffer fools gladly, but in my experience, he was very kind and generous to, to young, genuine young scientists, actually. Uh, and Sydney, the, 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 the same. And Fred was, was great, too. I mean, in many ways, Fred is the greatest of them all because he won two Nobel Prizes, and you know, arguably, he should have won three because he worked out the structure of proteins, he worked out the structure of RNA, and then he worked out how to sequence DNA, which everybody said was impossible, but Fred did it. And uh, the, I think the interesting thing is that all these people down, well, not all, John Kendra, obviously, should really be up here. Um, but, you know, I, I hung out with the Gurdon lab, and I knew John pretty well, too. Uh, and, and all these, these youngsters, uh, like uh, Marty and Roger, two Rogers, and, 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 you know, we were young scientists, and we did not consider ourselves to be in the same league at all as these famous heroes of molecular biology. But we chatted to each other, we explained what we were doing. We were doing hopefully interesting and important things. And, um, you know, in that sense, science is really easy. That's all you have to do to win a Nobel Prize. You know, just, just do something interesting and important. But so how do you know whether it's interesting and important? And if it is interesting and important, how do you know that you can solve it? And you need to work hard and have a lot of luck, I think. Anyway, um, largely thanks to these boosts, we, 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 we got the answer. I mean, I won't, I don't have time to describe how we got the answer, but it turned out that the inhibitor was a protein kind, an enzyme that sticks phosphate on other proteins and alters the activity of those uh, proteins. And the reason why we were so confused, I haven't shown any examples of the kind of confusion, was that there were actually four of these enzymes which we didn't know about. Um, and so, uh, it was incredibly satisfying. This was a problem I'd worked on for like 10 years, and often sort of thought I would never 
see the light of day. And finally, we solved it. It was a great feeling. It was also a great feeling because we beat my postdoc advisors with a punch. He, you know, he, so there was competition, and we won the competition. <laughs> I must admit that is very satisfying. <laughs> So then, uh, a couple of years later, I suppose it was, we organized an EMBO workshop to talk about translational control, which is an, an example. And I remembered that talk about, of Borsuk's about the sea urchin eggs and how they turned on protein synthesis when they were fertilized. Uh, and I invited Tom Humphreys, pictured here, to the meeting because he was the only person in the world that I could find who was still working on the control of protein synthesis in sea urchin eggs. Um, although by that time he was really rather more interested in sponges, but still. And it turned out he was a keen cyclist and wanted to borrow a bicycle. So I lent him my bicycle, and that's how we became friends. Is that, again, I can't emphasize, overemphasize the importance of sort of personal interactions in the progress of science. You know, we just liked each other, and it was this common thing in cycling. And um, what I didn't know was that he was the director of a course in Woods Hole. And when he came back from his cycle, I said, Tim, how would you like to come and help teach in Woods Hole next summer? Because there we've got some sea urchin eggs, and you could actually we were able to do some experiments together. So I, I leapt at the chance and, and went. Actually, that first summer was a, a pretty much a bust because it turned out the embryology course, and I wasn't really an embryologist at all, but interested. Um, you know, what, mostly what was got you took a phylum and you took some eggs and some sperm, mixed them together, and then watched development for the third one of the microscope. And they weren't equipped for molecular biology at all. And there was an Elvis impersonator on the Cape that summer, and we used to follow him around, you know, the little groupies. He'd only slow, sing the slow numbers of Elvis Presley songs, but we. It was, it was, anyway, so we spent a lot of time going to the pub late at night and dancing. And it, was, it was very nice, but not scientifically very productive. But I really... <laughs> <laughs> but I went back. I missed, the following summer, I missed it dreadfully. I mean, there were also lots of lectures, so you actually learned a lot. And I learned a fantastic amount over the years there. I mean, I, I went back in 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85. I mean, I really spent quite a lot. We would spend two, two or three months every summer there. Because I got, to, once you sort of got the hang of it, it was OK. But it, it did take a while to sort of that. So here I am getting sea urchin eggs. They're a beautiful, deep red color. And I really ought to take a new color photograph sometime. But I haven't been back to this for quite a long time. And you give them a little electric shock, a 12-volt electric shock alternating current, and they shed their eggs, or if it's a male, they shed their sperm. This is called dry sperm. Of course, it's not actually dry, but it's very concentrated. You had to then figure out what the right concentration was so that uh, one sperm hit one egg. And here you can see sperm zipping around in the background, and this egg is fertilized. And um, about an hour after it's been fertilized, it very slowly and majestically divides in two. And that was pretty cool, you know. And then after that, it divides every half hour. This is pretty remarkable. It's only 17 degrees, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's good. And uh, it was true what Borsuk had said. When you fertilized them, uh, there was a big increase in the rate of protein synthesis. And you see it. We're really used to this is a sort of standard experiment I've been doing all my career, measuring protein synthesis some one way or another, here yeah, just by the counts, against time. And in order to get a rate, of course, you have to take more than one point. It's very important, one point when it strikes. Um, and then that second summer, I collaborated, I, I got on very well with Eric and Joan, and they are following up a, a previous partial observation of the, I think, the year before, actually by Fergus Kafatos in this group, was that in clams, this is, this is a clam egg, uh, when you, after fertilization, they started making new proteins. This is a one-dimensional SDS gel. So that's a protein, that's a protein, these dark, they have radioactive bands. And you can see, in the unfertilized eggs, they really don't make any of these things, particularly obviously, B, there might be a trace of C. And um, 
Uh, and that was very interesting. So, um, and that was important. And that was an example of using up-to-date technology on an unfamiliar system. So that was actually turned into a paper in cell because nobody had looked properly at these clowns before, and we proved relatively rigorously this was a really good example of translational control. So that was good. But it was Eric's PhD problem. I longed to work on it, but it was his problem. Couldn't, couldn't work on it anywhere. I was sort of working on other things at the time, the sea urchins, for example. But I began to sort of think quite a lot about this business about the divisions and why were they making new proteins and what happened after fertilization. And I, I think you can see here, this is a picture that I took myself of the, the clam egg before and after 15 minutes, I think, and 10 minutes after fertilization. And what you can see is a complete change in the structure of a thing. The nucleus disappears, and it would be hard for you to interpret this, but these are actually chromosomes on what's what we call the first meiotic spindle. You can worry about that. And uh, how does it happen? Well, the answer is it happens without any new DNA, RNA, or protein synthesis. So it happens somehow entirely by modification of the proteins that are already there. You can't tell what kind of modification. Maybe some proteins got degraded, or maybe got phosphorylated, or acetylated. I mean, there are thousands of post-translational modifications that might occur. And again, you know, one didn't think too clearly about that, but that's. That's the name of the game. And then that summer, I heard this wonderful talk by John Gerhard, who was a, a, basically an enzymologist. And he talked about what happened when frog oocytes matured. This is actually not quite the same as fertilization. It's actually preparing them for fertilization. Inside a female frog in the spring, she's absolutely full of these, uh, these cell, big cells. They're almost a millimeter in diameter. And the cells around them produce progesterone. And uh, if I add some progesterone, you'll see what happens. A, a white spot forms. Okay. Uh, and a few years before, uh, Yoshio Mizui, a Japanese postdoc working in Yale, had discovered that what this was to do with the progesterone and new protein synthesis allowed the conversion of an inactive precursor that was already present in the oocyte, it was a, a sort of factor, we call it maturation promoting factor, that uh, brought about this transformation in the cell and the establishment of this, this spindle. And the way he proved that was by sucking out the cytoplasm from an egg and injecting it into a fresh oocyte. And now this oocyte reacts very fast to this compared to progesterone. So, whatever it is, but it, it proved that actually there was something in there that just needed some kind of trigger, okay? Uh, don't know what it was, because if you tried to purify it, and Gerhard described his attempts, he, it, it went away, it, was it appeared to be terribly, terribly unstable. And, uh, but I was intrigued because whatever it was, it was pretty clear as an enzyme, you know, it died if you boiled it or treated it with proteases. Um, and I thought, what a delicious problem. But it wasn't my problem. I couldn't work on it. Um, but it set me wondering about cell division. And as you've seen, when these eggs are fertilized, they do start dividing. So it was all in the back of my mind. And um, the only attempts to sort of follow MPF showed that it wasn't just something you found in frogs in meiosis. It also came back in frogs in mitosis. It wasn't just in frogs, in fact, first found in starfish, and then later in human and even yeast cells. And amazingly, whatever this stuff was, it was sort of universal. Human MPF could work perfectly well on frogs. I'm not sure if anyone ever tried human MPF, frog MPF on human cells. And then I did the experiment uh, that changed my life. And it was an experiment designed actually to compare patterns of protein synthesis in parthenogenetically activated eggs rather than fertilized eggs. But what I noticed was something that could and probably should have been noticed by people years before, because there was nothing very fancy about the technology. I simply fertilized some eggs, added some radioactive methionine, uh, and took samples every 10 minutes, and then ran them on this acrylamide gel. And what I noticed was that this protein here 
which was actually the easiest to detect at early times, so it was a really abundantly newly synthesized protein, disappeared just before, here's the eggs divided for the first time and the second time. And what you can see, I think, is this protein disappears just before the eggs divided. So I thought, oh, wow, uh, this is most unusual. In fact, uh, it was really impossible because proteins can't disappear like that, or at least they couldn't in 1982. Uh, they can disappear in your stomach, for sure, but then they all disappear. How could one protein in the cytoplasm and egg go away like that? So because it was so impossible, nobody had even suggested it theoretically, but there it was. I mean, you can see it. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have to be a genius to see that something funny is happening. It goes away, and then it comes back, and then it goes away. And I could show also that if you block cell division, it didn't go away. So you have to, something about cell division makes it go away. And of course, it was easy to imagine that maybe you, know, you had to make it in order for the cells to divide. This is easier to see. I mean, amazingly, so Eric and Joan have been working on these clam eggs for the previous three years, and they haven't noticed that those proteins, which are called A and B, went away because they never took time samples. Uh, so, you know, it sometimes pays to be a bit stupid and simple-minded. Um, and it's really obvious now. I mean, of course, I've improved the technology slightly. Uh, you can see these proteins coming and going and coming and going. And, you know, we turned out that this going here happens just 90 seconds before the chromosomes come apart. We timed that here. And if you inhibit protein synthesis, you know, the next division does not take place. So it's hardly an act of genius to suggest that maybe this is part of MPF and you, you make a subunit and that catalyzes cell division. And then to complete the division, you have to get rid of this stuff because otherwise you're stuck in mitosis forever because it's an enzyme that catalyzes mitosis and you need to go back to interphase. So let's just have a look at mitosis and interphase. Here are some, I think these are pig epithelial cells that I found on the internet. And green is the tubulin uh, cytoskeleton, and red is the chromosomes, okay? And this cell here, when I set the movie going, is gonna divide. And again, you'll see the sort of total reorganization that takes place, catalyzed by MPF. Here we go. And there's an interesting feature about this movie. So the, the tubulin all rushes in to form this structure called the mitotic spindle. And then the chromosomes have to be lined up, and it takes quite a while in this movie for them to line up correctly. You can see all the chromosomes sort of not lined up, right? And then it goes back, you can get captured and put on the midline. You know, they're still backing about a bit. And then finally, when they're all lined up, whee, they come up. <laughs> and then they then go back to where they where they were. So and this cell is just about entering my faces, right? So uh, I realized anyway that I had sort of stumbled on something which looked to me like it important for cell division. So, but I knew absolutely nothing about cell division. So you sort of start reading and chatting to people about it and asking. And I discovered that you know, there was mitosis and then there was in between mitosis when DNA was synthesized and there were gaps between them. And then there were what would now be called checkpoints you don't enter mitosis with damaged chromosomes, for example. And as you've seen in that movie, the chromosomes all need to be lined up before you get out of mitosis. And uh, this is a very important point, too, in the decision to start making uh, DNA is the heart of cancer problem. So what's it all about? Well, it's really, uh, I love this quote from Sydney, a moment of absolute enlightenment, a reduction of biology to one dimension. Uh, he'd been reading von Neumann, and he realized that the DNA molecule really corresponds to von Neumann's tape. There's a famous essay by von Neumann in something called the Hickson Symposium, which you can find online as H-I-X-S-O-N, in which he describes the logical requirements for a self-replicating automaton. And what you need, I think there are three things you need. You need this machine, which is capable of building the automaton. You need the instructions for the machine. And then you need a mechanism for copying the instructions and putting them into the new machine so that machine can in turn carry on the, the process. And you, you, you see this, and the DNA can 
contains all the, all the instructions. And that will be, that's sort of, you know, this is a sketch scenario again. At a later stage of development, you'll see all these premises then hacking apart. So they've been replicated. You can't see the replication, of course, in this. You can only see the, the delivery. So, you know, what it means is that uh, <laughs> the cell cycle really should be thought of as preparing to copy the tape, copying the tape, then prepare for insertion of the tape into the new machine, and then, uh, you know, share. But it's not really insertion into new because we actually share the copies rather than. So I don't know, that makes a logical difference, but I'm no logician anyway. But I think it's nice to think of it like that, and it's a sort of good way to think of it like that. So then, uh, what else was known about the control of the cell cycle? Well, Lee Hartwell had started a process by which he discovered genes that control cell cycle transitions. And probably the most interesting one is called CDC28 that controls a process called START, including the triggering of DNA synthesis. So that seems pretty important. How does that gene control that process? Um, my boss, Paul Nurse, following Lee's footsteps, uh, used a different kind of yeast called uh, Schizosaccharomyces pomni. And he focused on this mutation here, which blocked entry into mitosis, because you could either inactivate this gene, in which case you couldn't enter mitosis, but you could also, he found a mutation which hyperactivated it, in which the, the, gene, the cells divided to smaller than the usual size. So he knew this gene could either be killed or altered to make it more active. So it had to be, he felt, a control mutation and worth focusing on. Uh, and it came as a surprise when actually it turned out that CDC2 and CDC28 were interchangeable and it caused a lot of confusion because people uh, expected these things to be different. And the trouble with all this was, so CDC2 and CDC28 became very famous and important, uh, but there was no mention of cycling or disappearing proteins in, in any of this. And it took a while to figure that out, I must say. I mean, we had to clone and sequence and express and make antibodies against our cycle, of course. And I won't go into that because it took us uh, longer, perhaps, than it should. We didn't really take enough advice from the expert. But on the other hand, we learned for ourselves, so we learned very well. But meanwhile, in, back in Denver, Colorado, um, Fred Loker, who'd worked with the great Missouri, had discovered you could make cytoplasmic extracts of these eggs simply by spinning them. So take this tube of eggs here and spin it, and you get this beautiful yellow layer of cytoplasm. Nothing added, nothing subtracted. And amazingly, if you add nuclei to that uh, cytoplasm, it, the, the, you know, it, it forms these beautiful spindles. And where you add a little bit of calcium, which is how the sperm triggers the metaphase anaphase transition and uh, fertilizes the eggs, these chromosomes would come apart. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. So you can, you can do experiments on this because there are no cell boundaries. You, you know, it's just the, the cell in the tube. And using this system, Jim and Fred, I haven't been able to find a photo of Fred, and Jim alas died in a car crash a couple of years ago. Uh, they succeeded in purifying MPF, and MPF had two subunits, and uh, I remember Jim coming to Cold Spring Harbor to talk about this, not Cold Spring, MBL to give a talk about this, and I said, as soon as we have antibodies, we'll check whether this subunit is cycling, and it duly was. So then we knew the answer, which was that cyclins were an essential activating component of MPF. So here's, it turned out that CDC2, CDC28 was a protein kinase, which was completely dead, totally inactive, until it was turned on by binding to a cyclin. There's another step we probably won't, won't go into. So it's another protein kinase. So we were really stupid not to figure that out and think of it ages before, because there was sort of good evidence that there were increases in phosphorylation in those frog eggs. But we thought, you know, the, the paradigm is an example, of, again, of prejudice. The paradigm for the control of protein kinases was that they were held inactive by a repressive subunit. And there was no example of them being activated by an activator. And it's that kind of thing that just, you know, that we just didn't even consider the possibility that, that cyclin might be an activator of uh, MPF. I, you know, it's, it's unaccountable. And I, when I say we, I mean, there were some very 
people like my friend Andrew Murray and Mark Kirshner, I mean, they're, they're no intellectual slouches, but we, you know, it's never crossed our minds or anything. Oh, anyway. Uh, so it's, you know, what had seemed previously extremely mysterious uh, turned out to be very simple. A cell makes cyclin, the cyclin binds to CDC2, CDC2 turns on, it phosphorylates proteins, lots of proteins, and that's what brings about uh, entry into mitosis. Leaves a lot of questions, of course, you know, I mean, how many substrates have to be phosphorylated, how much, but that's another story which I won't go into. Oops. And simply say that I think the trick to good science is to follow your nose wherever it may be and try to question your own prejudices, which is not easy because you don't even know that you have them. Thanks very much.